All right, turn to Matthew chapter 8. As we come into Matthew chapters 8 and 9, Matthew strings together 10 uh, miraculous things that Jesus will do. These are very amazing, different miracles that Jesus will accomplish. Remember when we first uh, began the Gospel of Matthew, we saw that Matthew is writing primarily to a, a Jewish audience, his Jewish brethren. Everything Matthew writes is to prove that Jesus is their long-awaited Messiah. He is the promised king who is going to sit on David's throne. Um, he was going to establish a throne that will last forever. The first four chapters in this gospel shows us from his genealogy that Jesus is descendant from the kingly line, King David, and uh, Jesus is the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Matthew gives us Old Testament prophecies that speak of his miraculous conception, the virgin birth, that he had to be born in Bethlehem. Then he gave us uh, prophecies about John the Baptist, who would be the forerunner of Jesus Christ, preparing the way for the Lord. In chapter 4, Jesus had to uh, be tempted in all points as we are. And yet Jesus was without sin. So important. Remember I gave you that stat from last week? Um, uh, Probe Ministries, they did a, a, a survey of 18 to 39-year-olds uh, in 2020. 30% of so-called, they identify as born-again Christians, 30% do not believe Jesus was sinless. I mean, that's a tragedy. I mean, Jesus is perfect in every way. Hebrews says that he is without sin. So you got to believe the word or not. Then as we saw, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us those principles of how God's people should live as subjects of his kingdom. Now Matthew wants us to see the power of Jesus, that he has authority, all authority, as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, to do all things for the glory of God. Through these miracles that we're going to see in chapters 8 and 9, it's to demonstrate to us that he is a fulfillment of many of these Old Testament prophecies, again, that speak of the Messiah's power, his authority over all things. After all, what good are someone's credentials? Uh, what good is somebody's principles for living if they don't have the power to back it up? I mean, think about that. Buddha said a lot of good things. This is how you should live your life. But he had no power to back it up. Same with Confucius and the rest of them. There's no power. Only Jesus can tell you this is how we live, but now I'm going to give you the power to live it out because in our own strength we can't. And so through these miracles, Jesus will prove to us that these signs and wonders are the real deal. These are genuine miracles as opposed to lying signs and wonders that the enemy uh, and his followers can do. So let's pick up chapter 8, verse 1. It says, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Back in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, When he went up the mountain, and he gives us the Sermon on the Mount, it says, Multitudes followed him up the mountain. We saw in the first part of that, the Beatitudes, that his kingdom is being filled with people who know they are poor in spirit, and so they're mourning over their sinful condition. But as they come to Jesus and begin to hunger and thirst for His righteousness, He gives us a pure heart, because only pure heart people can see Jesus. And so He has to change our hearts. We're not pure, we're sinful. But then we understand that Jesus is the great physician. He alone is our Savior. He alone can give us a heart transplant, so to speak. He washes away our sins. He gives us a, a pure heart, a new heart, and then He alone can bring us into His kingdom. So anyway, back in chapter 5, it says multitudes went up, and here it says great multitudes are now coming down the mountain with Him. So again, thousands of people are following Jesus at this moment. Verse 2, And behold, a leper came and worshipped Him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, I titled this message, Hope for the Outcast, and we're going to see that Matthew gives us these first three miracles, and they're not necessarily in chronological order, but he puts them together because he's showing us Jesus is not ashamed to identify with anybody, to touch anybody. Hope for the Outcast. He's going to touch a leper. He's going to heal a Gentile servant. 
a Gentile soldier, you know, slave, servant. He is going to heal a woman. And this is very significant. This is very important to understand. What he is doing is breaking down barriers. Look at this scene here. We have a leper. Leprosy was one of the most dreaded diseases in the Middle East at that time. It would attack the nervous system. It would take away all sensation. The person wouldn't notice it right away because it would start internally, and then it would slowly but surely work its way to the surface of somebody's skin. They would have like a little blemish, a white spot or something. You go in uh, Leviticus 13, it tells you if you have this skin condition, go to the priest, they'll examine you, and then they'll put you in isolation. If it heals up, oh, it wasn't leprosy. If it gets worse and turns into leprosy, then you would be uh, you know, deemed as defiled. You would be, you know put out of the city. It was just a horrible situation. Now, again, a very, very bad disease. It would literally eat away all of your extremities. Once it broke through the skin, it would go to your extremities. So your fingers, eventually they would fall off. Your toes would fall off. Your nose would just go away. Your ears would just rot away. They say you could smell a leper from over 100 feet away, just the rotting flesh that they were living with. I mean, it was brutal. The average lifespan once you were diagnosed as a leper was nine years. So it was a very slow, painful, nasty death. They were quickly shunned by the people around them. Nobody could touch them. Nobody could hold them. I mean, it was brutal. If a leper was walking down the street and he saw somebody coming towards him, when they were 150 feet away, he'd start to yell, uh, unclean, unclean. He'd have to shout it out so the people coming towards him would walk around, avoid him. They had no contact. It was dreadful. In the Jewish Talmud, it lists... 61 different defilements that could come upon people, the Jews' life, if they were disobedient to the Lord. Now, it's not necessarily scriptural, all the things they came up with, but they, in their minds, because you did this sin, you're going to be defiled by God. So number one on their list was death. Disobey the Lord, you are dead. Number two of defilements was leprosy. They were known as the walking dead. The Jews looked at lepers as just on the brink of death. They were getting what they deserved. They must have done some horrible sin. That's why they're being punished for their sin with leprosy. Now, that is not always the case. God didn't, you know, curse everybody that got leprosy with leprosy. A lot of times it's just because of the fall of our, our sinful nature. It's because of Adam and Eve's sin. Leprosy is just another disease that... There's thousands of diseases out there, and that's just another one of them. But there's a few instances recorded where God did inflict leprosy upon someone because they stepped out of God's will. Remember Miriam, Aaron's uh, sister? She opposed Aaron, came, oh, not Aaron, Moses came, Aaron and Moses' sister, but Moses. She opposed Moses, came against Moses. God struck her with leprosy, and it was all over. And then Moses prayed, and the Lord healed her. There's an example. Another example is King Uzziah. He was a good king, it says, of Judah. And he did something bad. He goes into the temple and he offers a incense, you know, incense burning. And, and the Lord struck him with leprosy. He ended up dying with leprosy. But not always was that the case. Sometimes it was because of sin. Most of the time it was just because you're living in this fallen world. Remember when the disciples came to Jesus, and they questioned this guy that was born blind, and they asked him, so why is this guy blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? So they just assume, well, that's why he's blind. He must have sinned. This is what Jesus said. Look at the verse, John 9, verse 3. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. In other words, this is not punishment because of some sin. This is because of the fall. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. In other words, Jesus is going to use that situation to demonstrate the power of God to do what God wants to do, the power to heal. Back to this leper, the Jewish people were terrified of them. Again, they only saw them as having the curse of God upon them. Oftentimes they would see lepers. Not only would the leper have to cry out unclean, many times they, you know, people would run up to lepers and start throwing rocks at them. 
They were, they were just mean to them. They were just brutal to them. If you even accidentally touched a leper, you would be considered unclean. You'd have to go to the priest. Again, Leviticus 13 tells us what you did to examine a leper or somebody that might have leprosy. Chapter 14 in Leviticus, what to do if and when somebody was healed of leprosy. So these priests that we'll talk about in a moment, they had no idea what Jesus was about. Anyway, here's this leper. He comes to Jesus. And I can just picture this great multitude of people following Jesus down the mountain. They're freaking out as this guy approaches Jesus. It's like the parting of the Red Sea. You know, they could probably smell him. They see this a leper, and, and they're like, whoa, and they're just backing away. And this guy just goes right up to Jesus and falls on his face before him. And it says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Again, I can only imagine the desperation that this guy felt. Everybody despised him. Everybody was afraid of him. He had no hope. No love. There is no cure for leprosy. It's known as Hansen's disease today. You can Google it. There is no cure for it. I mean, they can give you stuff now that will stop it from going further. But only Jesus can bring ultimate healing of leprosy, as we'll see in a moment. This guy was in the final stages of leprosy. How do we know that? Because in Luke's gospel, the same scene, it says, this man was full of leprosy. That means this guy's got no hands left, no feet left. His face is pretty much gone. And he falls down before the Lord, and it says he worships him. So death is literally looming over him. And he says again, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. All three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know, record this story for us. By the way, this is the only time, or the first time, that somebody calls Jesus Lord. And it's this leper who is so desperate. Did you notice he doesn't question Jesus' ability to heal him, but he's questioning Jesus' willingness to heal him and make him clean. Again, this man had been turned away by religion. He had been looked down on by the religious authorities. So again, he's not questioning Jesus' ability. He knows he can heal. He knows he can cleanse him. But he has doubts about his love for him. Lord, if you are willing, you can. I know you can do it. But I don't know, Lord, if you're willing to take a chance on somebody like me. I don't know if you're willing to touch me, a leper, one who is totally outcast, totally despised. You ever felt that way? How many people had religious people saying to you, God doesn't really love you. He doesn't love your kind. <laughs> You're a mess. Maybe if you go clean up your act and come back, maybe God will accept you. I mean, I heard that growing up. But how many of us just came to Jesus in total desperation and said, Lord, I know I don't deserve anything good from you. I know I'm a mess. I know I have fallen short. I have sinned against you. I wouldn't blame you, Lord, for turning, uh, you know, turning me away. I don't deserve anything good from you. But if you're willing, I know you can save me. And guess what? The Lord is willing. Jesus said He came to seek and to save those that are lost. He doesn't desire to any, for any to perish, Peter says, 2 Peter 3, 9, but that all would come to repentance. So yes, Jesus is willing, but we need to be willing to come to Christ by faith and receive whatever He has for us. Look at verse 3. Then Jesus put out His hand and touched Him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately His leprosy was cleansed. This is a beautiful picture of what Jesus can do for anyone who will come to him by faith. He will touch you. He will cleanse you of all sin. By the way, this is why leprosy is such a powerful picture of sin. And you'll see that as an illustration many times because leprosy starts off unseen. It's in you when it starts. Like we have sin in us. It doesn't always come out and manifest itself right away. Eventually it will. With leprosy, eventually it'll come to the surface. If they go unchecked, they will eat away our lives and eventually destroy us. Again, there is no cure for either one. 
unless Jesus touches you. He's the remedy. A healing touch from Jesus. And make no mistake about it, Jesus is willing to reach out to you, to touch your life, to save your soul, to give you everlasting life. Last time I was in India, I was introduced to this guy named Long, Longi, and he was Karbi Yanglong tribe. And um, he came up, he was all excited, just beaming, and he was just so happy to see us. And, and um, Emily knew him for quite a while. And uh, I noticed he didn't have any fingers. You know, half his face was kind of just distorted. And um, he goes, I had leprosy. And he was a priest in a pagan religion there, this other tribal group. He was in a priestly line. And when he started getting leprosy, man, they were doing all their incantations, everything trying to get him healed. He kept getting worse and worse. Some of the missionary church planters, Emily knows, went to him. They prayed over him, and the leprosy stopped. And it didn't grow back like we'll see here, but it just stopped. And he is just such a testimony of God's love and grace. So he gets saved. Tons of people around him get saved. His ministry is to pray for these people that are untouchables, like the lepers in that area. And it was just a blessing just to put my arm around him. And <laughs> Great man. So anyway, back to this unclean, untouchable, unloved leper. Jesus puts his hand out. He touches him. Uh, I'm sure the people that is great multitude, they're astonished. He's touching. What would, why would Jesus touch this guy? That's not, that's not good. Nobody touched a leper. Nobody would touch a leper. But Jesus did. And immediately his leprosy, it says, was cleansed. Again, this is probably the first time in years this guy's ever been touched. You were isolated. You got diagnosed. You were kicked out of the family. You were put outside the city walls. You'd only live with other lepers. It was just a brutal situation. But what love flowed from Jesus to this desperate man, what compassion this guy experienced from the Son of God, and to be immediately cleansed, what we see here, what Jesus did, this is, why, this is a miracle, because instantly, boom, hands, fingers back. Toes, feet are back, his nose is back, his ears grow back. I mean, it was like skin, no longer rotten and stinky. Now he's got skin like a little child. This is what God can do. This is how powerful Jesus is. Look at verse 4. This always cracks me up. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one. <laughs> yeah, right. I haven't been able to touch anybody for years. Now you tell me don't tell anybody, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest. This is Leviticus 14. This is what you're to do if somehow your leprosy was cured. These guys hadn't seen for thousands of years a leper healed like this. These priests didn't. They're probably like, where do we turn? What do we do now? Where do we go? They didn't have you know chapters and verses, but in Leviticus 14. So that's why he says, go show yourself to the priest. Offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now it's interesting though, because Jesus says this to a few people over, over his ministry. Don't tell anybody what I just did for you. Every time he said that, guess what they did? They told everybody what he just did for them. How could you not? You can't keep quiet about this. I'm forgiven. I'm saved. I'm clean. All my sins are washed away. Luke, 5, uh, Luke 5, 15, look at this verse. We're told that after this leper was healed, and Jesus tells him, don't tell anybody about it. It says, however, the report went around concerning him all the more. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. They didn't realize, man, if he can heal a leper... He can heal whatever I've got going on in my life. And that's a great thing to understand. Whatever you got going on in your life, physically, spiritually, emotionally, Jesus can touch. He doesn't have to heal us, but He can. He can do whatever He wants. He is God. In Mark's Gospel, it says that this guy went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter concerning his cleansing from leprosy. So again, that's the first of ten miracles recorded in Acts 8, or Acts, Matthew chapters 8 and 9. So next we see this encounter with this Gentile, Roman centurion, this soldier. And then he's going to go to Peter uh, in Peter's house and touch, Jesus will touch Peter's mother-in-law. Again, why is this significant? Because 
the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they love to brag about how they prayed. And part of their prayer every morning, and they let you know, I'm praying, listen to this. They would say, thank you, Lord, that I'm not a woman or a dog or a Gentile. So here we see that Jesus going to those, they look at dogs, these lepers. They look at women, and they're like cattle. Uh, they, they look at Gentiles, you know, logs for the flames of fire and hell. That's how they looked at the Gentiles. So Jesus, Matthew, again, pointing people directly to what Jesus is doing, reaching out to the outcasts. So he's purposely, powerfully crossing over all these cultural barriers that kept these people from knowing God and knowing God's love for them. Verse 5, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. A few things to take note of as we look at this scene before us. So after he heals the leper, he's coming down the mountain. He's met by this leper. He heals this guy. Then he goes to Capernaum. This is a famous fishing village there on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. All those Cities around Sea of Galilee that Jesus cursed, and they're one of them. They're just archaeological ruins to this day. There's only one that he didn't curse. That's Tiberias. That's the only city on the Sea of Galilee. Back in that day, there was about 10,000 people or so that lived in these cities. So Capernaum, we think of it as a fish, fishing village, but there's pretty good community there. So he comes into Capernaum. Again, this is one of my favorite places to go in Israel. There's a lot of neat archaeological sites but this has so much that's uncovered. By the way, this would be Jesus' home base um, for most of his three-and-a-half-year ministry, Capernaum. He would minister from here. This is where he's already called out uh, Peter and Andrew to follow him and James and John to follow him. They were fishermen from Capernaum. This is where Nathaniel and uh, Philip grew up nearby. In chapter 10, Matthew, who's writing the gospel, he's a tax collector, and it's in chapter 10 where, where we see Jesus calling him out to come follow him. So again, Capernaum is a very important place in Israel. Most of the miracles that we read at, uh, about in these two chapters took place there. Also notice it says a centurion came to Jesus. Who are the centurions? Well, they were elite Roman soldiers. Century or we get for 100 years, that's what it means centurion, he oversaw 100 Roman soldiers. A legion of Romans was 6,000 Roman soldiers, and so they had 60 um, centurions overseeing the 6,000 other soldiers. And they were very elite Roman soldiers, by the way. Um, every time we read of a Roman centurion in the four Gospels and in the book of Acts, it's always with high praise. It's always with, you know, picturing them as men of character and honor. Remember in Acts chapter 10, the first official Gentiles that get saved or at the house of uh, Cornelius. He was a Roman centurion. Remember Peter is given the vision, uh, this sheet of all unclean animals lowered down before him. He's in Joppa and he's up on the roof getting hungry and then God shows him all these unclean and God says, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. No way, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything clean or common. And God did this three times. Don't call what I've cleansed unclean or common. He's preparing him for going to a Gentile's house because they looked at the Gentile still as unclean. And so the guy's knock on the door right after the vision stops. He goes to Cornelius' household. He preaches, preaches the gospel to Cornelius, his friends. All these people gather in the house. All of them get saved. They all have the Holy Spirit come upon them. Centurions. Who was at the foot of the cross when Jesus was dying on the cross? This is a centurion. He's the one that proclaimed, truly, this man was the Son of God. That was one of the centurions. So here, the centurion is pleading with Jesus on behalf of his dying, paralyzed servant. How do we know he's dying? A few more details are given to us. Again, in all, all three synoptic gospels talk about this scene. So look at these verses in Luke 7. This fills in a few gaps for us. Luke 7, verse 2 says, A certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So this guy's on his deathbed. So when he heard about Jesus, 
he, the centurion, sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. That's what they're saying about him. Well, notice that the centurion doesn't say that about himself. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. So here in Matthew, it looks like the Roman centurion is going to him, but Luke says, no, he sent elders speaking on his behalf. In that culture, if you sent somebody to speak on your behalf, it was as if you were there personally. The scene, when we look at this, the, the centurion is probably going there with the elders, stops about 50 feet short of Jesus and sends them ahead. So he's hearing everything that's going on here because he's going to cry out to the Lord here in a moment. So the Roman centurion... Um, sends these elders to speak, and um, we'll also see the centurion did not come to Jesus himself because he was a humble man, because he knew he was not worthy to even stand before Jesus. Somehow the centurion, though, is drawn to the Lord. Think about the Romans. What was their religion like? The Romans worshipped all kinds of pagan gods. They were ordered to worship Caesar. This Roman, stationed in Galilee, most Romans didn't want to be there in Palestine or Israel. They didn't like being there, but somehow this Roman centurion probably started to hear about the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His heart was being tugged by the Holy Spirit. Somehow this guy's thinking, well, there's got to be more to life than this paganism that I've been involved with. And so it says of this Jewish, uh, the Jewish elders say of this guy, he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. By the way, again, this is one of my favorite places, the synagogue. Do you have that picture? In Israel? There it is. So that's the synagogue. This is actually a second century synagogue in Capernaum. And go to the next one. And yeah, there's another picture of it. So you, you see all the homes would have been the dark rock there. Um, and just to the right, we'll talk about Peter's mother's, uh, Peter's home in a moment. But go to the next one. So the synagogue. So this is our tour guide, Mahdi. And he's pointing out the original uh, foundation of the synagogue that this centurion built is still there. So you're going back 2,000 years, and we're reading about this centurion who built this synagogue, and uh, there's black basalt stone that was the original foundation. That's what's uh, there. That's why all those ruins of the buildings look so dark as black basalt. Anyway, it's an amazing scene. This centurion has been hearing some amazing things about Jesus, and now that he's desperate, he pleads with Jesus, Come, heal my servant. Look at verse 7 back here in Matthew 8, and Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Again, he's willing to cross this cultural barrier, this line to go to a Gentile house. Jews would never do that. They're dogs. They're kindling for the fire. We're not going to go there, but Jesus is willing to do it. Now, according to the Jewish religious authorities, this would have defiled a Jew if you went into a Gentile house. But the amazing thing about Jesus he would touch lepers. Well, now you're defiled. Where's the proof? The leper's healed. He, how can he be defiled? The guy's perfectly healed. Goes into a Gentile's house. He's not defiled. Everywhere Jesus went, he took people that were defiled and he changed them to make them clean. So he never got defiled. So anyway, that's why Jesus isn't afraid to touch anybody today, no matter how wicked, no matter how sinful, no matter how defiled you, me, how bad we've been, only Jesus can bring cleansing, forgiveness, and healing into your body, your soul, your spirit. Jesus says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So Jesus says, I'll come, I'll heal him. Notice in verse 8, though, the centurion answered and said, so again, he's probably like 50 feet away, and he's hearing, he's, okay, I'll come, I'll do that. And here's the centurion saying, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. 
Let it, but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. That's why he says, all you got to do, Lord, just speak the word, because I know what authority looks like. I'm a man of authority, and I can say this, and they do it. All you have to do, Lord, I see you have ultimate authority. All you have to do is speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Now, it's interesting to me that the Jewish elders told Jesus that this centurion is worthy and deserving of Jesus healing his servant because of what the centurion did for the Jews there. But here we see the true humility of the centurion. He goes, I'm not worthy. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should even come under my roof. Again, he knows, I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve you to come over. I'm a sinner. But he acknowledges Jesus again as Lord. Lord, I'm not worthy of this. That's how all people need to come to Christ. Not as though, you know, he has to listen to us. Not as though he has to do what we want him to do. But we come to Jesus and acknowledge him as Lord, as Savior. Who do we think we are telling Jesus what we think he should do and how he should do it? That's the arrogance. And that's the lesson we learn from this Roman centurion. He's acknowledging the far superior authority that Jesus has over his own authority over a hundred men. This is why he says to Jesus, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Man, that's what faith looks like. He truly believes not in faith. He truly believes his faith is in Jesus Christ. He knows Jesus can do the impossible. So watch how Jesus reacts to his statement. Verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. There's only two instances where Jesus, we're told, marveled at something. He marvels at this man's great faith. The other time he marvels, it's in Mark 6, verse 6. He marvels at the unbelief of his fellow you know, citizens there in Nazareth, his hometown, because you know, they just didn't believe in him. They didn't trust him. This guy's the carpenter's son. We know his family. He can't be the Messiah. And he marveled at their unbelief. So here he marvels at the Roman centurion's faith. Verse 11, And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So when you see kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, it's interchangeable. We're going to be with these guys, these Old Testament saints. We're going to get to hang out with Noah, Daniel. I mean, it's going to be awesome. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be there. But the sons of the kingdom, this is a reference to the unbelieving Jews, will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. So again, this is heavy duty. After marveling at the Gentiles' faith, his trust in Christ, Jesus then says, Many people... We're going to come from all over, all over the world. They're going to listen to They're going to hear this guy's testimony. This is going to be great. We're going to have fellowship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But those who reject Jesus as Messiah, they're going to be cast out into outer darkness, it says. There'll be weeping, gnashing of teeth. Nobody can automatically go to heaven. You cannot be born a Christian. No such thing. You can't be born a Jew and think, oh, I'm Jewish, so I'm going to go to heaven. You have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. God, I can't remember who originally said it, but it says, God does not have any grandchildren. God only has children. It tells us in, Roman, or in John chapter 1, verse 12, that as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gives the right to be called children of God, to those who believe in his name. You have to put your faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation. Make sure that you have done that. 
For by grace we've been saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Did you also notice what Jesus said to this Roman centurion? He says, go your way. He didn't say, okay, now you got to stop being a Roman soldier. That doesn't fit this lifestyle of following me. No, he says, go your way. In other words, continue to be who you are. And go your way, and as you believed, in other words, you can be a true believer in Jesus, wherever you are, whatever your job is. If you're in the military, like we heard last night with Chad Williams, you know, you can serve the Lord in the military. If you are a carpenter, serve the Lord as a carpenter. If you're a school custodian, like I was for three and a half years, you serve the Lord as a custodian. By the way, when I was there for three and a half years, that's when I first moved here in 1985, that was the only job available, being a school custodian at Pomona Elementary School. And a lot of people are like, why would you do that? Well, there was no jobs available. It's not like today. In 1985, 200 people applied for a custodian opening. 200 people for one job at Grand Junction High School. I applied, didn't get it. Palisade, I applied, same thing. 150 people applied for that. No, didn't get that one. Everybody said, you don't want to apply at Pomona. That principal there, she is nasty. And um, I said, I don't care. You know, that's fine. So I applied, and she actually hired me, and that was great. And I was so proficient. You know, they always say, if you want to find how to do a job quickly and, you know, efficiently, this is what they did in the Navy, I was told. You get the two laziest guys in the unit and you give them a task to do because they'll always find the quickest, easiest way to do it. Well, that's what I was doing. So I got there, Pomona Elementary School, eight-hour shift, get there at three, it was three, yeah, three, and I went to work till 11.30 that night. So 3.30 in the afternoon, kids get off school, they go home, and then I get to clean up after them. That was always fun. You know, clean the toilets, mop the floors, that was my job. And I got proficient at it because you look for ways. To, you know, I don't want to do this for eight hours. So I got it done in four, four hours, four and a half hours. And I'm like, okay, it's clean. looks good. Supervisor comes by. He goes, you're done already? He goes, yeah. This took a couple of weeks before I got in the routine. I said, can I bring my Bible in? This is before I was a pastor or anything. I wasn't even thinking about being a pastor, but as I was a Christian, can I bring my Bible in? He goes, oh, sure. Yeah, we'll do whatever you want as long as the school is clean. So okay. So I bring my Bible. And then a little bit later, it's like, well, I got plenty of time. So I started bringing in commentaries and I set up a little office in the janitorial closet and I had a little library going there and I'm just studying for like four hours every night for three, over three years. And God was using that for preparation for this. You know, it's amazing what God can do. It's like, here I am, Lord, use me. I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> so yeah, whatever you do, carpenter, janitor, Teacher, do all that you do for the glory of God. That's what we see here. Colossians 3, that's what it was. Colossians 3, 23. He says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what Jesus is encouraging this Roman Gentile soldier. Go your way. Keep walking by faith. Keep walking with me. Just keep looking to me. Don't walk by sight. And he says, let it be done for you. And so his servant, again, he was near death. He was instantly healed. And with this leper, Jesus touches him. He's healed. With this servant, all you had to do is speak the word. And he was healed from a distance. As we'll see, there's no method, there's no formula when it comes to Jesus healing people. He does, this is important, he does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. It's not up to us to tell him, you got to do this for me. No, he's the Lord. So we don't tell him what to do and how to do it, when to do it. But by faith, we trust him to do what he knows is best for us. And we'll look more detail. We'll see this next time, Lord willing, unless the rapture happens first, which would be great. But so often we try and place Jesus in this little box and tell him what to do and how he should do it. How arrogant is that? He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. 
We know he can do whatever he wants to do, but like with the Apostle Paul, Paul pleaded with him three times, Lord, please remove this thorn in my side. God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. And so he learned to walk in the strength of the Lord in his weakness. And that was more important than if he would have healed him and just done his own thing. God knows what we need, and that's where our faith comes in, to trust Jesus with everything, knowing that ultimate healing won't come until we stand before him in glory, in our resurrection bodies. Otherwise, guess what, folks? If he healed us of everything all the time, you'd never die. We wouldn't. So eventually, something wears out, something falls apart, something locks up, and you die. You get buried. You can be 100 years old, great. You can be 70 years old, great. You can be 30 years, you can be 28 years old like Keith Green. It was his time, God took him home. You don't know, but we trust the Lord. Don't be arrogant and say, well, I'm going to tell him what to do and how to do it. I'm going to put God in my little box. I'm going to do A, B, and C. There's a group out there, and this is what their philosophy was, and there's still groups out there. They say, if we do A, B, and C, God must do this for me. You can't do that with God. Again, it's the epitome of arrogance. We submit to Him. We're under His authority. He can heal. Is He willing to? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes He's got a better plan than what you think is best for you. Look at verse 14. Let's wrap it up. He says, Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, so some people say, Oh, he went to Peter's mother-in-law. No, this is Peter's home. He saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever, And so he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served him. You get that picture? So Peter's home, maybe, under there. Yeah, could, well, I'm saying maybe it could be. Nobody knows 100% sure. It's not like Peter's like, Peter was here, you know, carved in there, or Cephas's home. But they, they assume this is Peter's house. It's right in the middle of Capernaum. And you can see, I wish you had another picture of it from a distance. It's crack up. Because the Catholics, for whatever reason, they think, this is what happened here. This is Peter's house. They built this big, giant spaceship over it. Literally, you back up a ways, and you see, it looks like a giant spaceship over You can climb up in. There's stairs going all up. And they got a big plexiglass thing. It's kind of cool. You go up there, and you look down. Oh, ooh, there's Peter's living room. Oh, there's the toilet. Oh, I mean, it's like weird, but I don't know. Maybe. So he goes, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, he, he goes there, he saw his wife's mother. Well, there's a problem for the first pope. He's married? How does that line up with Catholic Church? 25 years later, Peter is still married. How do we know that? Well, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5, written about 25 years after this, Paul says, Do we not have no right to take along a believing wife? as also do the other apostles. So thinking not just Peter, but, you know, John. I mean, all these guys. The brothers of the Lord, that would be James and Jude. And notice Cephas, that's Peter. So Peter was married. 25 years later, he's still married. We don't know anything about Peter's wife. But I think she was a really strong believer. I think she's probably there in the upper room on the day of Pentecost when the 120 are gathered together there. So she's a follower. And I, I, I can guarantee she was a faithful wife to Peter. But here is Peter's mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. Dr. Luke tells us, again, Dr. Luke, he wrote the Gospel of Luke. He says it was a very high fever. It literally means she was on her deathbed because she was so sick And it go, it put all three of the uh, synoptic Gospels together, and it says, Jesus went over her, rebuked the fever, it left her. He took her by the hand, and He lifted her up out of the bed. She immediately started serving the people in the house. And that's what it says here. He touched her, and the fever left her, and she arose and served them. What do you think she served them? I would serve in an out burger to Jesus. Wouldn't that be cool? Jesus, let's go for an In-N-Out burger. I already told you that's where the name came from, right? Did anybody Google that, by the way? Jesus says, I am the door, John chapter 10. 
you know, he comes to me, will go in and out and find life. I think that's where it comes from. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. It's a Christian-owned company, so maybe. Anyway, what would you serve Jesus? And she immediately, notice, immediately arose and served them. So the whole household. This is a miracle because, I don't know, when I had COVID and I was getting over it, I mean, it took a couple of weeks before I started feeling decent. And then I still had, people still think I have, COVID brain. <laughs> you know, things are a little fuzzy. She immediately is healed. She's immediately serving them. There was no lingering effects from whatever illness she had. Again, God's grace extended to outcast people, lepers, Gentiles, women. That's what the society looked at as outcasts. But Jesus came to touch people who were outcasts. You know, this whole thing going on in our nation, you know, about we have to have all this equity among all the different color groups and they're trying to divide everybody up into color groups. I'm so glad that in Christ there's neither Jew or Gentile. There's neither slave or free, neither male or female. We're all one in Jesus. You know, when we get up there, he's not going to say, okay, all you 10% light color skin people over here, all you darker, you know, here. He's not going to do that. What color is Jesus? I don't know. He's Jewish. Darker than me, I guess, but it doesn't matter. We're all one in Christ. He breaks down all those middle barriers, those walls we put up between people. He looks at you. He looks at me as people who are outcasts, as people he has touched and brought into the family of God. And we got a big family. And it's getting bigger all the time. Praise the Lord.